So folks, uh, welcome as you come on board to the Zoom. We're gonna wait about 30 or 45 seconds uh, before I introduce the, the mayor and Mickey and um, the mayor and Mickey, I like that. Uh, <laughs> um, but let's have a few announcements from the chair of uh, the climate action team, Lori. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, uh, I'll just mention, uh, since we have a, a couple of seconds, some things we have coming up, uh, we're going to do a free showing of a documentary called Kiss the Ground uh, during the month of April. And if you watch for the Herald, you'll be able to get the link to sign up for that. Uh, I have to say, uh, you'd think a documentary about dirt wouldn't be very compelling, but it really is. It's very engaging. Um, it's really fun to uh, follow a Great Plains farmer rancher as he figures out how to save his farm from bankruptcy and uh, improve his soil and his actually make money and help feed the world. It's, uh, it's just delightful. So watch, please do watch for that. And then uh, Nebraska Interfaith Power and Light are going to do panels, uh, one on regenerative agriculture and one on regenerative gardening. So you want to tune in as you're making your 2021 home garden plans. Uh, and then finally, I want to mention that Pastor Patrick Messer is going to do an Earth Day uh, special sermon for us with, for the nine o'clock digital service on Sunday, April 18th. Uh, kind of talking about, I think, the link between climate change and spirituality and, and why it's an issue for communities of faith. So watch for all those things uh, when you get the Herald uh, coming soon. Thank you, Jim. Okay, folks, um, people are still coming on board, but we'll begin to honor the time. And uh, so wonderful to see everyone coming on to our final week of the four speaker series on faith, climate change, and the spiritual imperative to take action. Um, one of the exciting elements of this has been for me about the networking between churches that it's creating. You know, churches, if anything, need to be a place of, of, of ethical reflection and then reflection that moves to action to help create a better world. And certainly climate change is one of the core ethical issues of our time. And we've been even exploring how that intersects with, with all of the major ethical issues like racism and economic justice. And, and how as you burrow down into the ethics of this, it gets to the very um, sort of essence of, of how greed and exploitation can ruin our human communities and our individual lives. And so to have this networking uh, between churches I think is wonderful. I'm, I, I'm also, I'm welcoming you again on behalf of Lori Benson and our climate action team, um, but, but then also welcoming uh, other congregations. So tonight uh, we have two speakers, the Honorable uh, Larry and Gaylor Baird, uh, Mayor of Lincoln and the Mayor's Senior Policy Advisor, Mickey Esposito. Now they're gonna tag you on a presentation about the proposed City of Lincoln Climate Action Plan. Um, now, the mayor, uh, Larry and Gaylor Baird, was sworn in as the 52nd mayor of Lincoln in May of 2019. She was previously serving on the Lincoln City Council, the Lincoln-Lancaster County Planning Commission. She is the current chair of the Mayors and Metro Universities Task Force of the U.S. Conference of Mayors and an active participant in the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative. She is an Aspen Institute Rodell Fellow in Public Leadership and a member of the New Deal, which is a national network of pro-growth state and local elected leaders. Her wonderful career includes experience as a management consultant, fiscal and policy analyst, Boys and Girls Club director. Uh, the Mayor, Mayor Gaylor Baird and her husband Scott have three wonderful children. Uh, we welcome the mayor this evening and also we welcome Mickey Esposito, who was tapped by the mayor to lead the Resilient Lincoln Initiative which focuses on the adoption and implementation of the city's climate action plan. Now she has special expertise in natural resources and environmental law and policy, as well as extensive senior level governance experience. We have two wonderful guests. Welcome to all and mayor, please welcome. Well, thank you so much, Jim. And I just wanna say my family and I are also proud members of First Plymouth. So this is like coming home for a conversation and about a topic that is so important and dear to so many of us. So, so thank you for inviting Mickey and me to be a part of your really important series on climate change. Uh, First Plymouth has just such a long and proud history of focusing on social issues, including climate change. And 
Your sustainable living ministry is a wonderful example of how First Plymouth gives congregates the opportunity to, to practice their faith in ways that make a real difference in not only in their lives, but in the lives of others. And it's definitely efforts like this kind of ministry that will make our climate action steps together a success. Um, a predecessor to our climate action plan here in Lincoln was the Lincoln Environmental Action Plan, or what we called LEAP for short. It was a guide for city action in the areas of energy and land use, transportation, waste, and water. And back when I was in a city council member, uh, I spoke at the 2017 news conference where the draft LEAP plan was released. We were out at Innovation Campus in their greenhouse, a facility that is heated and cooled by reclaimed water from our city's wa wastewater treatment plant, I might add. And when it was my turn to speak, um, I spoke about the rising temperatures on our planet and how they are already impacting our overall weather. I spoke about our economy and our future. And I, I said that with environmental action plans like the one being announced today, we can mitigate the risks that climate change poses to our economy, environment, and quality of life. I have to confess, I had been advised not to use those two politically charged words, climate change. Back in 2017, those words didn't have broad acceptance uh, in this part of the world. And I don't think the words had even ever been used in that document that we released that day. Um, but I felt it was important to use truthful words and to be true to my deep concerns about the subject. And I, I said those words out loud in public. And what I found out is that just using those two words seemed to just open a door. I mean, I immediately got phone calls and emails from friends and strangers and concerned residents who, who were thanking me just for saying those words um, and who wanted to be part of the solution. And those conversations continue today. Um, when I decided to run for mayor, I continued to talk about climate change and I continued to affirm that it was causing real problems and that those problems were being you know, amplified and contributed to by humans. And this issue was part of my campaign at the time. And then after I was elected, um, just two months later, um, I announced that we would have a new initiative to build on the LEAP plan. And this was a sustainability and resiliency effort to develop a climate action plan for our city. As part of that initiative, I announced that I would appoint a climate resiliency task force. And I then found myself in a bit of a tough spot that I didn't foresee. I had so many people, um, including members of the faith community, reaching out to ask to be a part of that task force that I had difficulty keeping the size of the group up to a manageable size. And I think we ended up with over 40 members. But this overwhelming support really affirmed for me that it was the right message for the moment. And the climate action plan that we'll be discussing tonight has, has really come about from our collective understanding of the need to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions to slow the pace of climate change but also to really protect people's quality of life right here in Lincoln. And the changes in climate that are already impacting us um, are becoming more and more clear. It was just a few weeks ago that we were dealing with record cold temperatures and snowfall, as well as rolling electrical blackouts. <laughs> I thought 2021 was gonna be a better year. <laughs> um, and it'll take our friends in Texas really so many years to recover from from the deadly winter storm that occurred there at the same time. And of course, we all remember two years ago, the, the record floods that threatened our well fields in Ashland. So as Nebraskans, we know that we can expect warmer, drier summers, um, wetter springs, more extreme rain events, potentially more frequent drought and more frequent and intense floods. Those are some of our vulnerabilities. And, and we know that weather can create economic instability from impacts to the state's ag sector and a range of climate related health impacts. We know that that can lead to heat related illnesses or respiratory illnesses or an increase in insect borne diseases. Um, a common belief in many faith traditions is that there's an obligation we have toward future generations. The idea that we have a duty to leave the world better than it was when we entered it. Um, and I served with someone on the planning commission many years ago, um, the late Roger Larson. And he was fond of reminding people that we all drink from wells we did not dig. Well, that has stayed with me. He is absolutely right, you know, metaphorically and literally. I mean, it is the case of Lincoln that 
you know, residents in the 1930s dug wells in Ashland that support us today for our water. So, um, you know, those pipelines that bring water to our city um, support our growth. We depend on uh, that water now. And later in the 1960s, the people of Lincoln ensured that the Homes Lake Dam was created to prevent flooding throughout central Lincoln and create really wonderful recreational space for all of us to enjoy. And then in the 90s, our community began the Antelope Valley improvements that help protect our wonderful downtown and really served us well a few years ago from flooding that would have likely resulted in millions and millions of dollars of damage to downtown properties had it not been a project that we completed. So these are just a few examples of how the community members of the distant and recent past in Lincoln have made really smart long-term choices and investments to make Lincoln strong and thriving. And I guess what I think of with this climate action plan that it's really how we take our turn in that work. It's our turn to do the good planning and to make the smart choices that will ensure our community continues to thrive for the next century. Um, but you know, really unlike our predecessors, we have to undertake these efforts in the face of an accelerated rate of climate change that poses really urgent and unprecedented threats to the quality of life that those generations of Lincolnites who came before us had worked so hard to create. So we have an ambitious goal. Uh, we want to bring about an 80% net reduction in Lincoln's greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050. And this goal, which you may hear, you know, many cities are setting similar goals. It's re often referred to as an 80 by 50 goal is uh, really an important way that we seek to transition to a low carbon future. Um, this is an all encompassing, really visionary goal that invites everyone in Lincoln to play a part in preventing climate hazards and to protect our quality of life. And embedded in the risks we all face are also um, opportunities, opportunities to innovate and create new jobs and technologies as we strengthen our infrastructure, reduce that carbon footprint and protect our quality of life. So our climate action plan embraces those opportunities. And it looks at what the city of Lincoln could become over the next 30 years. It's really a vision of a city that is thriving with local businesses and verdant greenways. And it's a city that uses both ordinary, but also innovative measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in transportation, in electricity and buildings. Um, it envisions a city that's inclusive, welcoming and fair. And the plan really is a reflection of our Lincoln values because we in Lincoln are collaborative, kind, we're innovative and forward-looking. So now is the time for that bold and achievable vision that will chart the course of the coming years. And by working together, we can harness our collective energy for innovation, for problem solving, and for a more just community to ensure that Lincoln is thriving into 2050 and beyond. And our community has an unprecedented opportunity to meet this moment together. I'm really proud that I get to work together with Mickey Esposito, of my senior policy advisor. Um, she's been a leader in our community for many, many years. She brings a wealth of talent and experience and passion to this work. Um, I wanna turn it over to her to share more details about the plan, but I also just wanna express my deep gratitude for her service uh, and her commitment. Um, this work is, can be overwhelming. It can be, um, you know, in some days depressing. But when you have someone like Mickey working with you who brings <laughs> joy and enthusiasm and optimism, and she's laughing, but I'm totally serious. Um, it makes the difficult work more fun and more possible. With that, I hand it over to you, Mickey. Oh, goodness. Thank you, Mayor. And um, your remarks are always so inspiring and, and moving. And it really was the vision of our mayor um, to take this bold step and, and examine and explore the possibilities that exist here for us. Um, so she gives me great hope. I think we get lots of energy from each other. And um, I'm excited to talk about this uh, with you tonight. So I'm gonna share screen and hopefully what you're seeing is what I'm seeing. Uh, big resilient Lincoln circle here, if I can get some head nods. Yes, this is happening. <laughs> Great. Um, so one of the things that we need to start from is just the baseline of what we mean by being a resilient community, 
being resilient in Lincoln and, and what we aspire for. Um, first of all, when I think about resilience in Lincoln, the good news is that in Lincoln, we have so much social capital and relationships are important in our city. Um, and when we're dealing or coping with a crisis or disturbance or catastrophic event, um, and we've seen this in the past, um, in addition to what we're experiencing now with COVID, we really have that incredible capacity for um, in our social systems to uh, sort of everyone helping, neighbor helping neighbor, um, everyone contributing to the solve and the solutions. Um, so it's our capacity to uh, really cope with that crisis, but then our ability to maintain systems, um, essential systems and functions within it and bounce back from that disturbance. And then finally, if there's any kind of opportunity for innovation or, or evolution or learning or adaptation, um, really that you are thriving within that crisis. Um, irrespective of what you're going through. And that's what resilience really is all about. Um, and you can see that in this pandemic that we've been experiencing, obviously a very um, uh, large disturbance across the globe, um, but we've been able to maintain systems and essential functions, bounce back from it, um, but also transform how we do things. And, and this is how we meet today over Zoom, um, over Teams, you know, virtually. We find ways to connect and keep business moving um, and, and relationships thriving. So one of the crises that we're experiencing currently is the climate crisis. Uh, Mayor is absolutely right. Um, in 2012, she and I experienced a really historic drought in our water system. It resulted in mandatory water restrictions at that time, um, followed by a 2019 uh, historic flood in the Platte River that impacted our well field um, and uh, resulted again in mandatory water restrictions. And so, you know, as a leader, mayor taking charge uh, and ownership of this issue and, and, and empowering me to, to really do the things that are necessary to implement a plan has been amazing. But the good news is that we have overwhelming support of this plan. Going into Monday, we have a city council hearing on Monday and there are just a great number of people in our county and our city who really understand the gravity of this issue. And it's interesting to see the policy discussions. You know, there still are climate deniers <laughs> out there, um, but people are really educated and informed about what really is happening and why. And so the policy discussions have moved away from climate, climate denial into an, a debate over methods and means and how do we solve this issue. And that's actually a positive uh, evolution of the subject. So trying to focus on the positive always, but the good news is people understand um, and are connecting the dots between what's going on with this sort of relentless rise of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas gases within the atmosphere and its impact to uh, global temperatures. Um, so they understand the data, they understand the connection and the relationship and why sea level increases are happening, happening at extraordinary levels, um, why sea ice and ice sheet decline are correspondingly happening, um, but also making the connection to what is happening right here in Nebraska. How do these global vital signs actually translate to our neck of the woods? Um, you know, where in California, we might be seeing more wildfires um, and in Florida, we might be seeing sea level rise um, or we might see, uh, be seeing hurricanes, you know, in the Southern part of the country. Here in Nebraska, we see severe storms, extreme uh, weather events that are increasing both in intensity, they're increasing in duration and they're increasing <clears throat> in frequency. So I want to show you this graphic that just really tells the story so well of what's going on and, and why it's so important to really plan proactively, but also um, 
why it's impacting us, uh, our, our not only costs, but lives and livelihood. So in 1980 to about 1998, that's about a 19 year period, we had eight events, um, extreme weather events that were cost us over a billion dollars. So each one of these bars uh, denotes an event that was over a billion dollars in expense in Nebraska. And from 1998 to 2020, which is a 22 year period, we saw 35 events um, that exceeded that billion dollar cost in Nebraska. That's a quadrupling in frequency of severe storms, wildfires, droughts, flooding going on right here in Nebraska. And again, it's not just about a monetary loss, but a threat to life and livelihood for folks. Um, and so we took this step in 2019, mayor commissioned uh, an understanding of what was going to happen both in our region and in Lincoln in particular. And the importance of that is really if, if we want to tailor a plan, an action plan for Lincoln, we really need to understand the challenges that we could potentially face if things were just sort of status quo, business as usual. And the findings and the projections of uh, Lincoln's future climate are here. Um, so if we change nothing and do nothing, uh, we'll be about five degrees warmer on average than today. 44 days annually, we'll see a heat index of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. There'll be a 10 to 16% increase in winter and spring precipitation totals. We'll have 4% less precipitation during summer, uh, during those irrigation months and then 15 to 30% increase in heavy precipitation, multi-day extreme precipitation events um, will increase actually in severity. So we'll have a lot of water when we don't necessarily want it and we'll have less water when we need it for those growing periods. And we are an agricultural state which supports our economy as well. So these are the kinds of things that we need to think about and plan for. Um, so in, light of what could be um, and what we might be prepare, preparing ourselves for, we also have to understand the climate risks that we're facing. And really, um, this is, if, I, if we analyze those risks, flooding is by far in the Salt Creek watershed basin is a huge risk uh, to Lincoln, but also the flooding impacts on the Platte River that impacted our well field. Um, is another uh, real risk. Drought has been a risk to us since 2012. We are in a drought period currently, and so it will always be one of those things we have to plan for um, and plan around. Uh, but we do have a single source of water that we need to um, make sure we protect, but also uh, take measures to look for a second source of water supply as well. Um, and with those three major risks, we have corresponding risks to public health, impacts to vulnerable populations, financial and workforce resources. We really need to examine our city policies for whether or not we are taking climate, these climate considerations into um, our ordinances, our policies, our plans, our designs, our engineering. How, how do we plan for these projections? Um, how will our transportation system actually change? We know that electric vehicles are coming online. More companies are really being very aggressive about that transition, which is a good thing. Um, and that means that fossil fuel reliance can decrease um, with even a change uh, like we have with LES, the LES board adopting a decarbonization goal um, by 2040. So lots of changes and lots of things in transition right now. Um, but what will happen with food supply, um, particularly because we are an ag state, um, how will natural resources be impacted? And then again, uh, we also need to make sure that we're informing and educating our public about not just what's going on, but the decisions that we make to respond appropriately um, so these are some of the risks that we need to be mindful of and are incorporated into the plan. 
Um, I talked a little bit about the coronavirus pandemic and, and things that we've learned. Um, as unfortunate as this uh, has been, it's really been a great lesson for all of us. And we've learned a lot um, from the pandemic. Sudden shocks to our system have enormous consequences. Disasters have cascading effects. Interruptions to food supply right here in Lincoln, that was a real threat and we learned a great deal from that. Um, it is possible to reduce emissions. We experienced that in the pandemic. Uh, crisis does bring both unexpected consequences, but also benefits. Um, social capital really matters. And here in Lincoln, we really covet that social capital um, and work hard to, to really um, take care of it and nurture it and cultivate it. Even in this process, we, we really did try to make sure uh, we, we reached every corner <laughs> of our city uh, to talk about it. Um, and then sadly, vulnerable populations. We've learned a lot about our um, you know, low-income, marginalized, historically marginalized communities and how they're hit hard at hardest, um, not just with respect to the pandemic, but with, um, with climate change. And so one of the, the most important things about this plan is the intentional work done around environmental justice issues. Um, that there will be fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So you, using this diversity, equity, and inclusion lens when, you, when we analyze decisions that we make about climate change, uh, is going to be really important going forward and where we focus our efforts in the plan. And we'll get into that a little bit further. Um, but there are these overlapping and um, sort of corresponding things happening, not just with climate change and the pandemic, but existing factors um, in socioeconomic trends. And so I want to touch on three uh, that, that are really standing out for us uh, that need to be addressed fully um, and we've been really intentional about. So poverty is the cause of all causes, really. And so um, in Lincoln, we have a statistic from the Lincoln Vital Science Report that says um, approximately 30% of households in Lincoln are in or near poverty. Seven census tracts are categorized as being in extreme poverty. And the neighborhood with the highest poverty rate is North Bottoms. Um, they're also at the highest risk from flooding. And that's um, relative to where, where they are uh, next to you know, Salt Creek and how that impacts them. And then we have an, another issue of disproportionality. So in addition, poverty rates are not evenly distributed across racial categories. The black population has a poverty rate more than twice as high as whites, followed by Hispanics and Asians. Whites make up the majority of Lincoln's population, but six of the seven neighborhoods in extreme poverty have a higher percentage of racial and ethnic minorities compared to Lincoln overall. And then I just wanna to touch on food insecurity. 13% of residents in Lancaster County experience food insecurity. Um, the COVID-19 crisis actually showed how easily food shortages can occur when supply chains are, are interrupted. And, you know, we even witnessed sort of the increase in the line of cars and patrons at food banks due to the pandemic. But imagine what will happen if global crop yields decline in a climate altered future that may create instability in the availability and pricing of groceries locally. And so you'll see one of the action items uh, in here is to increase and enhance local food production, which normally a city wouldn't get involved in. But those are some, some intersections with socioeconomic trends that are occurring and how we want to address uh, them in the plan. Another map I just wanna show you, this is information based on the median energy cost um, of homes in these areas, like in these red areas, particularly, this is where the median energy cost is divided by the median income. 
for these residential properties, pink being um, the next in line. This is just to demonstrate unaffordability of utility rates. And it's not just that uh, it's an income problem, but more than likely these are homes that are energy inefe inefficient. And so there needs to be a little more focus and assistance from our city um, and intentionality around helping these folks with weatherization and insulation, um, you know, trying to find energy efficiency uh, tools and methods to improve their situation and make living a little bit affordable. Now, if you overlay our poverty data where our census tracts exist, again, these red areas are the prioritized areas, but if you overlay the floodplain with these, um, with these areas, you can see where uh, it's really a compounding issue for people and they're experiencing burdens, a disproportionate burden. They're not only experiencing poverty, uh, but they're also experiencing the burden of flood. So um, just want to make sure you understand that we are very cognizant to these areas and, and these issues um, and the compounding factors that exist uh, where people and neighborhoods are facing multiple vulnerabilities. It's not just one thing, but um, sort of a confluence of many things. Um, Lincoln has actually a lot of success in the area of sustainability and environmental protection. We've been very proactive as a community and that's really positive um, because the work that we've done here actually has really paid off. Um, and if you look at our greenhouse gas emissions um, levels, we have a, a nice decline uh, actually by 23%. So we're on a good path. Uh, we should be getting the 2020 data soon from the health department. Unfortunately, health has been super busy with the pandemic, um, but they are working to get updated data. And the hope is just to see that continued trajectory downward. Um, but also we really haven't taken into consideration um, some of the tools that we would have in Lincoln for carbon sequestration. And I know Lori had talked a little bit about, um, you know, kiss the ground where you're gonna hear more about carbon sequestration, uh, not just in agriculture, but in a lot of places that, you know, Lincoln has, we have grassland, we have forests, we have public green spaces, we have tree canopies. Uh, we also have a wonderful composting system. And so there are lots of opportunities to understand this um, potential for reduction of atmospheric carbon and, and legacy carbon. So it's, it's exciting to think about. And one of the initiatives that we're keying in on is um, doing a carbon sink inventory and then a, a plan to really um, maximize these areas. Um, I just want to touch on uh, this slide a little bit and how I really see the cycle of democracy um, and, and how important public sentiment is, not just in this context, but in any context. It really is the driver for public policy and people matter. The citizenry, our residents, our businesses, when they voice their opinions about something, um, it really does matter to shape uh, public policy and out of public policy is born public funding priorities and out of public funding priorities are really born public projects. And so whenever I think about, you know, how important uh, a person's voice is, uh, this is a great example of really the public leading an incredible discussion. And you, you could see that in, in Mayor's remarks today when she said, I said climate change <laughs> and, and the flood of people coming to her, supporting her saying, yes, <laughs> we agree. Uh, and they do, 72% of adults in America think climate change is happening. And in right here in Lancaster County, 75% of adults uh, believe it's happening. 67% believe climate change is affecting the weather. Uh, and that's how it seems to be showing up here. Uh, and 79% believe climate change will harm future generations. And so they are really wanting us to do something about it. And that brings um, about this six year climate action plan. 
We do um, have two sister plans. So one is a vision document that takes us all the way out to 2050. And this six year plan is really a snapshot of what is achievable in the next six years by the city. Um, it does include the vision, the 80 by 50 vision. Uh, we will reduce net greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050 relative to those 2011 levels. And again, we're 23% down in addition um, the LES board adopted that aggressive 2040 net decarbonization goal, um, at, which will help tremendously to, to get us to this, this bold, bold vision. Um, we're also going to be resilient to climate hazards we'll face and strategic climate directions um, and climate resilience will be integrated throughout our actions, our ordinances, policies, uh, et cetera. So we're making decisions with climate in mind. It is a comprehensive plan that touches many, many areas. Um, and this really isn't going to be a one size fits all. It's gonna take many people, uh, private and public and individual actions. And we invite that it is a community-based plan um, and it involves so many things that we can do. Um, one area is transitioning to low carbon energy, but we also wanna address transportation. Uh, we want to align economic development goals with climate realities, improve protections for and with Lincoln residents, build a resilient local food system, maximize natural climate solutions, reduce waste, and of course, engage our community and educate and inform. Um, so we make really strong decisions, public policy decisions that are based on public sentiment. Um, just to kind of We've done a really robust public engagement process. And during that time of education, we also were prioritizing what was in um, the, the draft vision plan that was released in October of 2020. So we really wanted to even have more input uh, from the public about that. But originally there were over 600 ideas from the community on what to do. Uh, the draft plan released in October incorporated 365 of those strategies to meet the 80 by 50 goal. And an internal city team called the Sustainability Working Group and Mayor's Climate Resilience Task Force, a community-based team, uh, they reviewed, they assessed all of these strategies and in response to public comment that we uh, received during that time, um, we actually prioritized 120 key initiatives to focus on the next six years. We can't, we can't do everything in the next year, six years, but the six year horizon is really our capital improvement uh, program term. And so we wanted to bring that into the fold. Um, we keyed on things that we already do and will continue to do within authority budgets um, and resources that we have and then new recommendations. There are about 20 new recommendations that are funding dependent and require more dialogue with our public and our city council. Um, one example is the second source of water supply and we have to keep refining that as much as possible. Uh, the Planning Commission passed the Climate Action Plan unanimously in February and the council holds a public hearing on Monday. Um, so they will be hearing from us um, at 3 p.m. on Monday. And if you're interested in writing a letter, I'll drop that link in the chat and, or you can show up to testify with your mask and we follow all the DHMs. Um, but we are on track for implementation and we would love to kick that off uh, April 22nd or Earth Day. If I can bring that home for mayor, it would be great. So I just wanna get into a little bit where, um, just to give you a sense of some of these key initiatives. And uh, I talked a little bit about the carbon sink inventory. We're gonna analyze emissions reduction potential for each of the key strategies. We're analyzing landfill gas alternatives. We do burn it, uh, our methane gas, but we also supply electricity, a source of electricity to LES currently. Can we maximize um, that landfill gas for a different use? Uh, one of the most exciting things we're doing and a bold goal is to be 100% carbon neutral in all our municipal facilities by 2035. Super excited about that. In transportation, 
Uh, you know, we always want to continue strengthening active transportation, walking, biking, scootering now, um, and then public transit and really get that single occupancy vehicle, you know, off the road. And part of that is adopting a, a teleworking policy. We, at the city, know that we can be just as productive, if not more so, uh, even staying home and keeping that car home. Um, but another bold uh, vision is to transition our municipal fleet 100% to renewable electric or alternative fuels by 2040. And we're slowly but steadily getting there. Uh, aligning economic goals with climate realities. Um, like I shared earlier, the LES uh, goal of decarbonization is huge, but we also want to divest in fossil fuels. We, we really need to take and look at our investments at the city um, and see whether we can invest more in renewable sources of energy. Uh, we, we, we also know that there's a continuing effort to develop transit service. Um, it's called Nebraska Transit between Lincoln and Omaha. We've been a partner in that and uh, it could really build some workforce and promote tourism uh, for Lincoln. Securing that second source of water is so important for our future and our children and our children's children. So we are developing a strategy for that. And it includes not just the engineering strategy of whether we connect with MUD in Omaha or go to the Missouri, but also whether, uh, how do we actually fund it? We need a funding strategy. We need to talk to our federal and state partners about help um, for that supply system. Uh, implement the recommendations of the Salt Creek Resiliency Study. Uh, we have learned through new climate data, precipitation data. We used to use 1960s data. It's been updated by the national, um, uh, the FEMA. Uh, they've updated their standard to a 2014 standard. <laughs> and now it, it really does share that we have to focus on the Salt Creek watershed basin a little bit more because of uh, increased precipitation rates within that basin. We experienced in 2014 and 15 two, two severe floods that occurred, if you recall. And so we're reacting and responding to new precipitation data based on climate change. Um, and we really have to find solutions for how to address that, including ensuring vulnerable neighborhoods are are prioritized in emergency management plans. Um, food is one of the most exciting things. Normally a city gets involved in permitting or inspections, food inspections um, and health department inspections. And this is actually exciting. The city owns 1700 acres of farmland um, that it used that we use to house some infrastructure and on top, so underground infrastructure and on top, we actually farm them for row crop production or haying. And so we wanna use that uh, land for regenerative agriculture. And we want, want to also explore partnerships, entrepreneurial type pilot programs that help young people um, explore farming as an occupation on our land. So it's some really exciting things we're talking with community crops around and the parks and rec department on doing. And actually, instead of growing feed, you know, growing food that people can eat. <laughs> um, along those same lines uh, is maximizing natural climate solutions and really investing in soil and soil health to remove legacy carbon from the atmosphere. Um, there's an incredible engineering technology that exists. It's called photosynthesis and we should be maximizing it as much as possible and really emulating nature um, to take care of us. Uh, and so we'll be focusing a lot on protecting these areas and enhancing our programs around them. Reducing waste, always a priority. Um, we will be encouraging always the reduction of single use plastics. We are piloting a food diversion, uh, food waste program with LPS and UNL. That's very exciting uh, and turning it into compost. Um, and then we'll explore a green purchasing policy where the city buys responsibly, responsible uh, products um, that are sustainable as well.
And then again, the all important education, making sure people are informed and educated about what we're doing and what's happening, um, but also what they can do to help. All right, well, with that, I'll stop share and be happy to field any questions you might have. Well, thank you so much. You know, first, uh, also thanks to the mayor for her decisive action and forward-looking stances, um, even in even during a pandemic. So this is what strong leadership looks like um, to keep working on other deep, important issues. And Mickey, thank you for that wonderful presentation and your work for the city as well. Um, Addie, could you uh, could you begin to moderate questions for these folks? Sure. Um... Yeah, go ahead and feel free to put your questions in the chat box. I'll just start with the chat. Um, the first question says, thank you so much, Mayor Larian, for your deep and abiding commitment here. With the average Rocky Mountain snowpack becoming less in the future while melting earlier, since the Platte as well as the Missouri River, oh, sorry since the Platte as well as the Missouri rivers are fed by that source, is it wise to go to the Missouri as our second source? Might we tap more directly into the loop or other Sand Hill streams? What other options might exist? Well, thank you for that question. You know, we have worked with um, HDR and engineering firm in the past as we've had you know, water task force studies to try to answer this really important question. And in the past, the recommendation has come back to Missouri or, you know, recently been in discussions about tapping into um, Omaha's uh, MUD's um, excess water supply that also comes from the Missouri, you know, both options would give us a redundancy that we don't have today because they're not from the flat. Um, so I think that there may be just practical considerations with going in a different direction. None of it is easy. None of it is inexpensive. Um, we want to be really, really good stewards of our limited resources. Um, but were, were we to get advice as we explore these options that another option could be affordable and effective, we would certainly consider it. I don't know if Mickey has any follow-up on that because she was a charge of Lincoln Transportation and Utilities at the time that we were doing some of those studies. Um, she may have some additional insights to share. No, that's, that's right. We are developing that strategy as we speak, and it is, it is difficult. Um, there are benefits to both, but also cost, you know, cost <laughs> is really a huge factor. So, um, but that's, that's exactly right. And we want to be able to, to, to really hone in on that strategy in the next six years. Um, I think this was for Mickey. The next question it says, in a few sentences, can you define regenerative, regenerative, uh, regenerative agriculture? Sorry. <laughs> I would say um, as much as possible, uh, imitating nature. And, and when, you're, when you're trying to change, we change our farm contracts and we want to do no-till. We want to do cover crops. We wanna make sure we're maintaining as much and holding back as much water on our on properties as possible and eliminating erosion from those properties. We want biodiversity uh, in our crops and we wanna grow food that people can eat rather than feed. Um, it, it is a huge tool in our toolbox, not just for Lincoln or Lancaster County, but Nebraska. We can help our country reach these goals and, and so as much as possible, uh, imitate nature. Um, next question, it says, uh, this, while they appreciate greatly the plan's timeline of 80% reduction by 2050, do we have that much time? Well, I think we all know that there's very little time to try to reverse some of these significant impacts of a rapidly changing climate. Um, but we are really encouraged by the momentum and we certainly have a lot of faith in the ingenuity of people who are trying to tackle these issues from a technology perspective. A lot of, a lot of the goal as it stands, you know, will rely on the development of new technologies that don't exist today. Um, if we can get there faster, we should, um, but by setting this vision, we are trying our best to catalyze immediate 
pressing action. And if we get there faster, that, that would of course be um, much better. Um, but this kind of vision is how we're trying to galvanize our community and galvanize more collective energy towards making this a reality. And I think that that is one of the amazing lessons of the pandemic. Um, the pandemic has shown us that faced with a global threat to humankind, we can take steps collectively to meet that challenge and overcome it. And it takes science and it takes innovation and it takes some sacrifice, but we are very powerful when we work together. And I think that is the kind of silver lining um, that we take away from this global pandemic as we turn our attention to another global threat in the form of the rapid acceleration of climate change in our lifetime. Uh, next question is, um, has the city considered collecting green waste from restaurants to compost? Yes. <laughs> Um, and um, I know that we're experimenting first with LPS and UNL for that very reason. Um, we would love to grow that into more of kind of local restaurants, but we have to test it first <laughs> with our, our institutional partners. And so that's the first step. Um, but absolutely, if it's successful, uh, then we would love to grow it into um, having more partners. Yeah, and we love those kind of upstream sort of interventions because so much of the waste that goes to our landfill is food. And yeah. if we can prevent that um, from happening, we, you know, we'll slow down the production of methane and we will um, be able to use those resources for other purposes that help us grow crops or you know, fertilize and, and grow some of the re and do regenerative agriculture. So um, that's a really important way to think about this is how much how can we attack this problem at the most upstream point rather than waiting till we have the waste to deal with or the, you know, the, the products to have to re recycle. Um, the next question uh, someone wrote was, uh, can the city do anything with restaurants, grocery stores, and uh, um, other excess food supplies being able to share with other city mission? Um, so you kind of, yeah, if you want to touch more on that. Yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to. So part of, it's not just uh, when food becomes waste, but actually diversion of fresh food. Um, and that is, doesn't have a level of sophistication that we would like yet. Um, we do have some ongoing partnerships that we're trying to leverage, but I think for right now, we just don't have those institutions built. And that's one of the things, one of the areas that we have to work on a little more intentionally. So solid waste, while they're prepared to deal with food waste, what we wanna build over the next six years are the relationships between grocery stores um, and nonprofits and restaurants getting fresh food um, from even entering the waste stream. So that's gonna require a little bit more relationship building and uh, networking on our part, um, but that's, Right, that's one of the conversations we're having. And I think the last question kind of covers that. It's just kind of the same question, I believe, as well. Oh, wait, here's one, another one, sorry. Can the city <laughs> provide funds to help local organizations and nonprofits to update their organization's strategic plans for environmental resiliency and justice? So, oh. Uh... I guess I, I guess, would just yeah you say, yeah the answer well, mayor has purse strings. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, yeah. I mean I would love to be able to do that and maybe mm -hmm. in the future that will be a possibility and we certainly like to leverage our um, our institutional expertise. Um, you know we are facing budget shortfalls as a result of the pandemic. We've got gaps in our parking revenue, just to name one, you know, people aren't coming downtown, we aren't generating parking revenues, those millions of dollars add up and, and we use those dollars to support our budget. So, so we're, we're experiencing many of the financial strains that businesses are experiencing in this moment. Um, we're feeling very fortunate to have um, this new infusion of federal dollars headed our way through the American Rescue Plan. We really want to put that those dollars to work for our people and our businesses and for our environment and to protect our quality of life and, and to protect lives and livelihoods. So 
as we explore and learn more about how those monies can be spent, you know, we are going to be looking at how to have both an effective and an efficient and an equitable recovery from this pandemic and um, where we can where we can support other organizations and being a part of these climate solutions and being a, taking climate action, we want to be able to do that. Um, and I think at this point, it's a question mark about our financial capacity to do that. Uh, but working together and leveraging and forming these partnerships is a, is a lot of how things get done at the city. Uh, and if there are folks who are interested and want to know more about how to collaborate, we welcome their outreach and see how we can be supportive. Yeah, great, great statements, Mayor. And we can provide at least staff time and resources, but um, and one of the ways we're doing that is LPS has really uh, looked to this plan as an example. Um, so that's that's a good thing. Well, thank you, Addie, is that the- Yeah, that's it, that's it. So again, I wanna Great say question. thank you to the mayor and Mickey. Um, it does not go unnoticed that you just came on at 6 p.m. on a weekday night to, to, to be in dialogue with uh, citizens and faith communities. Um, Thank you for that, that hard work. Also, I wanna thank Lori Benson and the Climate Action Plan, um, but maybe um, even most, I wanna thank each person that has been logging on to this. This is how it works, folks. When we, we gather together and uh, reflect and then create action, um, you know, I, as people of faith, we believe that God has a dream for the world and that dream for the world is equity and justice and wholeness and health for each individual and communities. We used to call that building the kingdom, but that's a little patriarchal and androcentric. So now we say it's building the kingdom and this interrelation we have as brothers and sisters on this planet. And um, so thank you for helping build the kingdom and mm -hmm. uh, thanks for being together tonight and may the spirit bless you all. Okay, God bless. Thank you, Jim. Thank, thank you, Lori. You. Thank you, Addie. Thank you. Thank you everybody at First Plymouth. Appreciate you. Loved everybody.